Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1210, Calculus 1 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In this video, uh, starting lecture 10, I want to talk about using limit laws to help us calculate limits. Uh, and that's because previously in this lecture series, we've seen actually two ways to calculate limits. Uh, the first one, if we use the precise definition of the limit using epsilons and deltas, we can be very precise in our calculations, but uh, that approach is very cumbersome, especially for uh, new folks to the realm of calculus. So uh, although we did introduce this idea of error and tolerance beforehand, uh, we're really not going to pursue that precise definition much more in this lecture series. Instead, we rely more on this intuitive notion where the limit is calculating what we expect the function to do, not what it actually does. And we saw in the previous lecture, number nine, uh, using graphical representations of functions, exactly what that means to intuitively understand what this limit is. But graphical approaches, although very nice and help strengthen our intuition, uh, they do have limitations. We have to have an accurate graph in order to be able to compute the, the limits in that case. And we also saw situations like the topologist sine wave, where even the graphical approach is insufficient and could be confusing. Uh, and so we want to, in this lecture, rely on an algebraic approach to computing limits. Now, all of the algebraic laws we're going to see in this video can be proven precisely for functions. Uh, and this would come from a theoretical approach proofs uh, relying on that epsilon delta definition of the limit. So in this in this video, we aren't going to provide the proofs of these limit laws uh, and just rely sort of on the intuition to, to fortify uh, these statements for us. So these are some rules of limits that we should be aware of. So in all of these limit laws, follow the uh, the following notation will be consistent here. So let the number little a, capital A, and capital B be real numbers. Um, you will notice that I'm using a little a and a capital A. This is quite common in mathematics where the variables are actually case sensitive. If you're talking about the function little f, that's not the same thing as capital F. Uh, which could be something very different. Uh, so when you write your mathematical notation, do make sure you are case sensitive, like maybe your password uh, online or something like that. So little a, capital A, and capital B are going to be real numbers. Little f and little g will be functions. And let the following statements be true. The limit as x approaches little a of f of x will be capital A. And the limit as x approaches little a of g of x will be b. So you'll notice that in both situations, these limits are as x approaches little a. Uh, in order for these limit laws to be true, we have to be approaching the same value, um, x, uh, x equals a right there. All right, so what are our first couple limit laws? The first limit law that we're going to have tells us that if we take some value k, which this is a constant, so it won't vary like f of x does. Uh, so if, f of, if k is a constant, then it turns out the limit as x approaches a of k is going to equal k. Uh, in other words... If you have a constant function, which would just be a flat line, and you're interested in what happens at x equals a, well, if you approach it from the right, from the left, excuse me, uh, everything's going to be k. And as you approach from the right, everything's going to be k, so the limit's going to be k. For a constant function, nothing changes, so you wouldn't expect it to suddenly change. The expectation is constants would be k. Um, on the other hand, if you take the limit as x approaches a of k times f of x, so if you take a scalar multiple of a function, um, geometrically, it has the effect of stretching the graph by a factor of k. If you were to vertically stretch a graph, that means you're also going to stretch the limit. So the limit of k times f of x is k times the limit of f of x. That is k times a, where a was the limit of the function. So uh, times in a function by k will also times the limit. And that does make sense as well if you have a function where your limit here is given as a, and then you vertically stretch that function, then the y-coordinate will also be stretched by that factor of k. Uh, limit law B, if we take the limit of f of x plus or minus g of x, this will equal the limit of f plus or minus the limit of g, which turns out to be a plus or minus b. Uh, so the idea with this limit law is that, that you, if you take the limit of the sum of two functions, this is a sum of limits. Or if you take the difference of two functions, the limit will be the uh, the limit or the difference of their limits. So that is to say you can take individual pieces separately. And we'll see this in just a moment. If you're taking like the limit of say like x squared plus 3x, you can break this up into the limit of x squared plus the limit of 3x. You can take the two portions individually. For which for the second part by limit law number 
one, you can pull out the coefficient three and you get the limit of x. So assuming we can compute the limit of x squared and x, we can do this polynomial combination. And so th these properties right here are starting to show you how we want to can algebraically approach these things. Um, one thing I do want to point out right here is if you look at properties A and B, uh, like we saw with the polynomial, property A tells us how we can take the limit of a scalar multiple. Uh, where scalar here, just a fancy word for a constant, multiple. And then property B tells us what we can do with, with sums and differences of limits. When you put these properties together, this is what's known as the linearity property. Uh, this is something we're going to see over and over and over again in calculus. Limits are linear. Derivatives, which we haven't defined yet in this lecture series, are linear. Antiderivatives, sums, that is sigma notation, integrals, both definite integrals and indefinite integrals, uh, infinite series, these are all linear operators. They satisfy the linearity property. And it's for this reason why when one gets exposed to calculus, it becomes ultimately necessary for them to study linear algebra, which is the study of linear things. And I'll, I won't say much more about that in this lecture right here. Let's continue with our rules of limits here. Um, just like when it comes to addition and subtraction, if you take the limit of a product, the limit of f of x times g of x, this will become the limit of f times the limit of g. And that becomes a times b. And I should mention with these properties, where you take the limit of some combination and break it up into individual limits, this limit, this, this limit property only exists if these limits exist by themselves. It is possible that the limit of a sum could exist, but the two summands don't ex the limits don't exist by themselves. But of course, under the assumptions we have right now, the two summands or the, the, the two components do exist by themselves, these limits. And so therefore we can decompose these more complicated things via operations. Um, property D is the, is the similar statement about uh, quotients here. If you take the limit of F divided by G, then this will be the limit of F divided by the limit of G, specifically A divided by B. There is one exception there. If the limit of G is itself zero, like if B is zero, then you'd get something divided by zero. That doesn't guarantee that the limit exists. This property can't. It turns out the limit could exist. It might not. Division by zero is a little bit but trickier. It's something we'll talk about at the end of this video a little bit more, and then also in future videos as well. So even though this list might seem imposing, the properties listed here are actually quite natural, and the viewer will grow to use them rather quickly right? Um, we will also mention that although we can prove the above properties about limits, I, I, you know, I mentioned that earlier, we're not going to do so because, again, that kind of gets us into what's called real analysis, the, the proofs of calculus things. And that's, that's something that would happen in a different lecture series. But let's apply these to some examples. Let's suppose that the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 is 3, and the limit of g of x as x approaches 2 is equal to 4. Notice that both limits are approaching 2. Um, even if you swap this up to be like 1.9, we wouldn't be able to combine these limit laws together. They need to be approaching the same value. So the limit of f is 3 and g is 4 as x approaches 2. So when you see something like the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x plus g of x, this would tell us something like, oh, this is the limit of f of x plus the limit of 5 times g of x, like so, as x approaches 2 in both situations. With the limit of f, we know that's equal to three, and we get this. We got we got this uh, decomposition here by law number two we saw on the previous slide, uh, and then since you have this constant multiple of five, the first law says you bring out the five and take the limit of g of x as x approaches two, which we see from assumptions that's four. How that's equal to four, we don't know. It just we just suppose we know that we get three plus five times four. We're going to get three plus twenty. And so the limit would be 23 based upon the limit laws that we saw previously. If we take the limit as x approaches 2 of 2 times f of x times g of x, well, you can bring out that 2. So we get the limit of f of x times g of x as x approaches 2. And then by law number 3 we saw on the previous slide, you're going to get 2 times the limit of f times the limit of g of x, again, as x approaches 2 in both situations. For which then by assumption, we see that the limit of f was a 3 and the limit of g was a 4. So we end up with 2 times 3, which is 6. 6 times 4 is 24, and that would be the limit in that situation. All right. 
So what do we do on this next one here? So we have a limit of f of x squared time or divided by the natural log of g of x. Well, the fourth law that we saw in the previous slide would tell us that this should be the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x squared over the limit uh, as x approaches 2 of the natural log of g of x. So that was using law D we saw on the previous slide. But what do we do past this, right? So we know that the limit of F is equal to 3. But what about the limit of F squared? And we know that the limit of G is going to be 4. But what about the natural log of G? Uh, we don't. It turns out this example illustrates that we don't have enough limit properties uh, as it is in order to, to cackle all of the type of problems one might see, all the types of functions one might see from pre-calculus. So let's add to our limit laws. And so picking up where we left off, uh, property E tells us that the limit as X approaches A, and so this A is any, any real number, right? Remember the same assumptions we had when we started this here. So as X approaches A, X to the N is going to approach A to the N for all positive integers N right here. So if N is any monomial, you'll see that the limit as X approaches A of X to the N is just going to be A to the N. You'll notice here that this is just function evaluation. To calculate the limit of a monomial, you just have to evaluate the monomial at this number inside of its domain. And so I want to point out that by this property E and the limit laws we saw previously, those linearity properties A and B, when you combine those together, this actually implies that we can compute the limit of any polynomial function just by evaluating the polynomial. Um, and we'll actually see in a forthcoming example, an example of such a thing right there. All right, so for any real number k, uh, if you'd have the limit of f of x to the k, this, so this is kind of like we had it before, right? Take the limit as x approaches a of f of x to the k, this is equal to the limit of f of x to the k, right? So you can just take the limit of f, which is a, and then you take a to the k. So you have some type of, um, some type of power expression where the exponent is fixed and the base is a variable. In that situation, you can just you can just take the limit of the base, which that actually has a lot to do with what we were doing a moment ago. That's exactly the setting we were in right here. This limit law, when applied, tells us that because we're taking the limit of a function to an exponent, this will just be the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x quantity squared, for which we saw that the limit of f of x was equal to 3, so this will become a 3 squared, aka a 9. All right, but what do you do about the denominator? Uh, we don't have enough information. What, how does the natural log affect the limit here? Uh, let's look a little bit more on our list. So in addition to property f, which guarantees that power functions, you can just take the limit of the base, for any real number b, which is positive, um, take the limit as x approaches a of b to the f of x. Notice the difference here. In this situation, the base of the exponential expression is now a constant. Um, that's why we require it to be positive, because if we allow negative bases, then that potentially could give us some imaginary numbers. We don't want that. Um, the base being 0 is also a little bit more complicated. We'll deal with that in a future video. Um, oftentimes, it's going to be 0, but there are some times where it might not be 0. Again, that's a topic for... Uh, another another lecture. Um, but in this situation, if you just have, a, just have a simple base, just a positive base, where the exponent is some type of variable, it could just be x, it could be x squared or something more complicated. In that situation where your base is constant, you can just take the limit of the exponent. And so the limit would be b to the a, like so. That doesn't help us out with our logarithmic expression. But then when we get to property h, that's exactly it. If we take a positive base, um, if we take a positive base b, that's not equal to 1. I noticed that it says b is positive twice there. I'm not sure why that's necessary. <laughs> Probably just a typo. Sorry. Anyways, if we just take an acceptable base for a logarithm, if you take the limit as x approaches a of log b of f of x, this will become log b of the limit as x approaches a of f of x. That is, you'll be the log base b of a. So if you have a logarithm inside of a limit, you can actually take the log outside and just evaluate the inner function take the limit in that situation. Same thing is also true for sine and cosine. If you take the limit of sine of f of x, this becomes the sine of the limit of f of x. And if you take the limit of cosine of f of x, this will become cosine 
of the limit of f of x. Now, if we can do, if we can take that and combine it with trig identities like the quotient identities and the reciprocal identities, um, that is sine and cosine generate all the other trig functions like tangent, sine over cosine, secant is one over cosine. Uh, since we can take limits of quotients and we know the limit of sine and cosine, we can then use this to take limits of other trigonometric functions as well. Um, and so these properties right here that we see that basically you can just evaluate, all right, sorry, you just take, push the limit inside of the function. Um, this has, this is a property which we refer to as continuity, which is a topic we will talk about in the next lecture in much more detail. But the typical functions we know about, um, exponentials, logs, trigonometric functions, algebraic functions, these are continuous functions on their domains. And like I said, we'll talk some more about that in the future. So returning to our question at hand here, um, by the previous property, property H, we see that the limit of the natural log of G of X as X approaches two, this will then become the natural log because the natural log is just base E, it's the log base E. So this will be the limit as X approaches two of G of X, like so, for which then G of X, its limit, remember, turned out to be four. So we're gonna get the natural log of four which if you want to, you can write that as two natural log two, although that simplification is not really necessary in the situation, but the final limit would be nine over the natural log of four. Let's look at a few more examples and then uh, finish this video right here. I mentioned previously that the laws of limits that we've seen already give us the tools necessary to take the limit of any, of any polynomial function. So take, for example, two x, two x squared minus three x plus four. Take the limit of that function as x approaches 5. So by previous properties, we saw that if you have the limit uh, of a bunch of sums and differences, you can actually break it up into individual sums and differences. Uh, that is, the limit of 2x squared minus 3x plus 4 breaks up to be the limit as x approaches 5 of 2x squared minus the limit as x approaches 5 of 3x plus the limit of 4 as x approaches five. Okay, so we saw that from property two in our list. Then you have some coefficients. So we have like the limit of two x. We saw by property one, property a in our list that these constant multiples can come out. This comes two times the limit of x squared as x approaches five. Uh, then we also get minus three times the limit of x as x approaches five. And property A also told us what to do with the constant function. If you take the limit of a constant function, y equals four, the limit will be that constant value. So the limit of four as x approaches five will just be four, because four doesn't change as x gets closer and closer to five. There's no variability there. So we would expect it to stay four. Um, then what do you do with these monomials? Well, we saw on the previous slide that by law number E that if you have a monomial, you can just evaluate it. So the limit of x squared as x approaches five will just be five squared. So you get two times five squared. And then for the next one, you're gonna be minus three times the limit of x. Well, x is just the monomial x to the first. And wherefore, we're just gonna take five to the first, AKA five, and you get plus four right here. And so simplifying this calculation, you're gonna get two times 25 minus three times five, which is 15 plus four. You get two times five, which is gonna be 50. Negative uh, 15 plus four is gonna be negative 11. And so then we take 50 minus 11 and we end up with 39. So that's gonna be the limit here. I want you to be aware because of this statement right here, 39 is just the evaluation of this polynomial at five. So if we call this polynomial, say f of x right here, then 39 is just f of five. When it comes to a polynomial, we can evaluate it because polynomials are continuous. Again something we'll define in the next, in, 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 in a future video. What if we wanna take the limit as x approaches negative two of x cubed plus two x squared minus one over five minus three x? Well, what we've learned previously is that when you have this quotient, we're gonna take the limit on the top and the limit on the bottom. That was law number D. So take the limit as x approaches negative two of x cubed plus two x squared minus one, and then take the limit of the bottom. We're gonna take the limit as x approaches negative two of five minus three x. You'll notice that the numerator is a polynomial, so its limit will just be evaluation. It'll just be negative two cubed plus two times negative two squared minus one. The bottom is also a polynomial, five minus three x, so its limit will also just be evaluation at negative two. Five minus three 
times negative two, like so. And you'll notice that, hey, this is a rational function. This is a quotient of two polynomial functions. By the same reason, so by, since polynomials limits can be computed by evaluation, it turns out that rational functions can also, with the potential exception of those places that make the denominator go to zero, right? Um, because law D didn't, doesn't work if the limit of the bottom is zero, which the good news here, if we evaluate the denominator first, you're gonna see that you get five plus six, negative three times negative two is plus six. That's gonna equal a positive 11. Um, and so the limit's gonna exist here. Let's continue on. We get negative two cubed, which is a negative eight. Negative two squared is a positive four times that by two. That's gonna give you a positive eight. And then you get a negative one. We see that the eights cancel out. You're left with a negative one. And so that will be the limit here, negative one eleventh.